Oh, hello, everyone. I'm happy to see so many of you so early in the morning. I'll admit 9, 9 a.m. is usually a bit early as well for me, but um, let's, uh, let's power through it. So I'll be presenting uh, a work that uh, my colleague uh, Lisa Leo and I did over the past um, seven, eight months, let's say, start, starting from December of last year, uh, which is entitled uh, Error Prevalence in NIDS Datasets, Case Study on CISIS 2017 and um, yeah, however you pronounce that, 2018. Um, so I'll, since I understood that there are quite some people as well from the malware and um, hardware security background. Um, now I, I assume that most of you will, will know what a what a network intrusion detection system is, but I'll just give a brief overview anyway. So in a network intrusion detection system, um, you're going to be um, looking at incoming and outgoing traffic and checking it for suspicious activities. Um, and then if there are any alerts, it would be sent to, for example, a NIDS management system, which in function of the severity or the nature of the alert can decide to alter firewall rules or change a network uh, topology or something like that. So the types of attacks that we usually try to detect when we're doing network intrusion detection are things like a DDoS attack, botnet attack, password brute force and infiltration. So there is a very clear trend in the research field for network intrusion detection, which I'll abbreviate it to NIDS uh, for now because uh, otherwise it's just too much of a mouthful. Uh, so in the past decade, we've um, seen that machine learning is the predominant approach that is used for network, network intrusion detection. Um, the main reason for that is that people wanted to step away from these rule-based approaches, which constantly need manual updating whenever there is there are new like types of malicious uh, traffic that are that yeah that, that could get known like basically like zero day attacks so the the aim with a machine learning based system is that whenever there's something new you can just feed it the data and the machine learning based system will learn for itself what is it what makes this traffic malicious so it heavily reduces the amount of work that the human needs to do in order to keep the network intrusion detection system up to date now of course when you're using machine learning based approaches or ai these kind of um, well, yeah, machine learning based approaches or like deep learning AI based approaches, you need a lot of data to train this and this data needs to be of high quality. And that's actually where we start to see the first big problem in the field of NIDS. Um, one thing that we noticed um, quite early on is that when you look at a lot of the state of the art that looks into machine learning algorithms for NIDS, they use heavily outdated data sets to train their classifiers. For example, if you look to the pie chart, pie chart on the right, um, fifth, over 50% of the papers that we looked at or that um, a certain taxonomy looked at that you can see on the bottom left there, um, these papers used for over 50% of them use the KDD 99 data sets, and then you still have some papers using the NSL KDD and DARPA data sets. Now, if you look at KDD 99 in the name itself, it already says this data set has been created in 1999. So that's over 20 years ago, meaning that the traffic in this data set is completely different from the kind of traffic that you see these days. Um, let's say, for example, these days you would have a lot more video traffic, streaming traffic, it would also have a lot more HTTPS traffic, so encrypted traffic, SSH, and so on. So the result being that if you're training a classifier and claim to have very good performance on the KDD99 data set, that doesn't really have any practical relevance for, you know, from a security standpoint. Sure, you can say that for machine learning, from a machine learning standpoint, like the new fancy algorithm you developed is, you know, is is nice, but from a security standpoint, you can't really claim that the NIDs would be effective in a real world environment. Um, so there is another research institute, the, the Canadian Institute of Cybersecurity, who noticed this trend as well and who set out to create more modern and up to date NIDs datasets, which are the CISIS 2017 and 2018 datasets. Now, these data sets are absolutely massive, like combined, especially the 2018 one, like combined, they have over 500 gigabytes of network traffic. They have a, they're, they're much more diverse um, and have a good diversity of benign and malicious traffic. Uh, they offer both the raw traffic and also the, the flow based data, which I'll talk about in a bit. And more, yeah, most crucially, these data sets have been 
widely adopted by the research community. And just to give an idea of like how popular they are, of these like 1,900 citations, the like about a thousand of them were just added in the last year alone. So that's why that's why we chose to work on these data sets because they're they're by far the biggest ones out there in the field of NITS. One thing though that we noticed was that there were not a lot of um, papers that addressed like the or assessed the qualities of these data sets. So that's where we came in then. So what did we set out to do then? We set out to assess the quality of these two, two data sets. And for any kind of issues that we found, we um, would provide the improved data set to the research community, as well as any kind of hope. Oh. All right. Um, and also any kind of fixed uh, tools that we would um, develop in the process and then of course also provides provide some best practices to the community like what if you you know if you're doing some uh, new kind of data set generation in the future what are the kind of things you should look out for um all right so just to give a bit of background for these data sets of course they are provided in pcap format so you have like the raw bytes if you want to um, but if you're using machine learning based approaches you're usually going to use some kind of feature extraction process to make some kind of higher level statistical features in order to feed to your AI algorithm. I mean, technically you can just feed like the raw binary, like the, the raw packets in binary format to your AI, but I don't know, you'd have to be very brave and like exceedingly optimistic in order to hope that the that, that works out well. So traditionally what, what people use in this field of NITs for their classifiers is to condense the data down into network flows. So I'll just give an example of what a network flow is. So say that you have a communication here between two hosts. They are both going to have an IP address. They're both going to have you know, two ports uh, between which the communication takes place. And it's going to be over a certain protocol. So if you take all of these five parameters together, like the source IP and port, destination IP and port, and the protocol, and you look at all packets that match this five tuple, those will all be put inside of a flow. So realistically, you can kind of say that for a TCP connection, a network flow will kind of just take all of the statistics of a single TCP connection. So for example, if there would be then UDP traffic between these two hosts, then that will constitute a separate network flow. And I think it's quite obvious then that if you're communicating with another host entirely, that that will also be a separated into another network flow. Uh, one thing though, is that normally for these network flows, you work with some kind of timeout uh, because let's say that, you're, that you have um, an infiltration attack ongoing where in a single TCP connection, uh, a malicious attacker you know, downloads all of the sensitive data from your database, which can take maybe like over 30 minutes or so. You don't want to wait 30 minutes before you give this connection to your network intrusion detection system so that he can say like, hey, wait, there's something suspicious going on. So what you what we usually do in this field is like we define some kind of timeout and say like, OK, after 120 seconds of traffic, or could be even less if you want to, um, we're going to cut the flow short there and already feed it to the NIDs so that he can make predictions in case that you know something's going on. Um, so yeah, just to highlight some of the places where we found issues, this is the dataset creation pipeline that was used for the 2017 CISES dataset. And actually, I mean, for the 2018 dataset as well. Uh, so we have, yeah, attack simulation, which is yeah, the, 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 the hosts that are being set up with, um, with the malicious scripts or tools that will execute the attacks, um, processing this traffic into flows, um, then from the flows doing the feature extraction, and then Feature extraction would, for example, be like how long is the flow? What is the source and destination IP? Um, what is the total amount of traffic in bytes that was sent over the flow? What are what is the average like interpacket arrival time? These kind of things, like high level statistical features that go over the entire flow. Uh, then, of course, if you need to feed this data to a machine learning classifier, you need to label it. You need to say, okay, this flow is benign traffic. This flow here is from a DDoS uh, high orbit ion cannon attack. Uh, this flow is from an infiltration attack and so on. And then at the end, you can also do some benchmarking, though this step is you know, less important for the creation of the data set, data set itself. It's just to give a, um, 
an indication of like what is the normal kind of performance you would expect from a NIDS on this data set. Uh, so for two stages here for the flow construction and feature extraction, the authors used their own their own tool, which is the SIG flow meter, in order to construct these network flows from the PCAP file. Now, yeah, and just for the record, we actually found issues with literally every single one of these stages. Um, I, I won't go over like all of this, all of the errors that we found in the stages, but I'll highlight some of them. Um, so this is arguably one of the one of the more severe issues, uh, which is the way that they um, the way that they transform a TCP connection into a network flow. So just as a quick um, recap, so this would be one single TCP connection. We see, you know, on on the left, uh, we see that we every rectangle representing a packet. We see that we first have the three-way handshake with the syn synac hack which establishes the connection and kind of like agrees on the parameters that will be used for the connection between the two hosts then we have some data transfer in the middle and at the end we have a similar like three-way handshake to terminate the connection it's kind of like one person's one host a saying okay i don't have any more data to send i'm ready to close the connection then host b also has to say like okay i also don't have any more data to send so let's agree to close the connection and then a final acknowledgement before the connection is teared down however what happens in the flow meter tool which the author is used to transform a tcp connection into a network flow is that they stopped the network flow after the very first fin packet so what you see here until the very first fin packet would be flow one and anything that comes after would constitute its own flow, which from the point of a TCP connection makes very little sense. And in fact, and in fact, you end up with these kind of artifacts with you know flow two actually having next to no meaningful information. So in, in our research, we decided to label these as a TCP appendices. Uh, and what's even more problematic is that we found that these TCP appendices, they constitute over 20% of all network flows in, in these data sets, not only in the 2017 data set, but also in the 2018 data set. Um, also, imagine that this flow one is part of a DDoS attack. So this flow one would have the label DDoS. In those cases, very often the flow two would also have, get the label DDoS, even though if you would look at this flow two in isolation, there is nothing in this flow two that could possibly hint at it being a DDoS attack. So it's purely an artifact that's only going to confuse your classifier. So I think already just with this issue alone, you can kind of see that if you're training a machine learning classifier on this, this kind of data set with these TCP appendices, and it achieves 99%, accuracy or like 99% like a F1 score, you really have to start questioning like, what is it actually learning? So our fix then is, you know, quite straightforward. We just um, fix this issue that they had with the closing of the fin, uh, the closing of the TCP connection and decide that, you know, one TCP connection should ideally be the equivalent of one flow. So now just to talk a bit about the dataset fixing approach, because obviously we have 500 gigabytes of network traffic, raw network traffic, which has been condensed down to 40 gigabytes of network flows. Obviously, like you cannot do manual analysis on all of that. It's infeasible. So there has to be, we did use some kind of structured and methodolo methodological approach in order to detect um, hopefully almost all of the issues in these data sets. So let's take here an example. So this is, um, just a snippet of what you would see in the CSV file of these um, of these um, network intrusion detection data sets with, you know, on, on the right side, there are actually still a lot more features that are cropped out. It's just for the sake of clarity, I left this in. So this would be an example of the DOS GoldenEye attack. Like all of these flows have the label DOS GoldenEye, like a denial of service kind of attack. And then we just start to like browse a bit through, through, the, through these attacks, which or well through the records that are labeled as DOS GoldenEye. And then, you know, we first notice something funky. So this flow duration is in microseconds, meaning that we see a lot of these flows have, you know, hover seem to hover at around like almost exactly five seconds. Um, so then, you know, we decide to look into one of these flows specifically. 
um, we look at the source IP destination IP, source port and destination port and timestamp in order to try to locate it in the PCAP files. So remember the, the thing that we were trying to look at is what is causing this like five second flow duration that we seem to see everywhere. And um, we just, you know, this is in the this is in the PCAP file. It's one, this is one TCP connection of the DOS GoldenEye flow. And then we see like, oh, so right after the attacker in this case is done sending his traffic, the victim server seems to be waiting exactly five seconds before you know, closing the connection. As we can see here, we have a, a fin packet being sent at the end. So, yeah, so the, the reason behind this is a bit more obscure. It has to do with um, the way that a DOS GoldenEye wants to keep, you know, so let's say when a DOS GoldenEye attacks a web server, he wants to keep the connection open as long as possible because the more connections that you can keep open indefinitely, that means that your web server's connection pool is going to be exhausted and it's not going to allow any more incoming connections and it's going to effectively be brought down. However, the web server, like the, the default Apache web server implementation, limits this timeout to exactly five seconds. So what we see here then is that a large majority of the DOS GoldenEye flows have this, like back a bit, have this five flow duration, which is purely because of a certain, you know, configuration in the victim, in the victim web server. So when you're feeding this into a classifier and you're asking it to detect, you know, what, what makes a DOS GoldenEye attack, a DOS GoldenEye attack, it'll point to this, you know, it'll, it'll learn this five second delay. Whereas, you know, you can easily just have a different network environment with a different web server setup where the timeout is not five seconds, but just one second. And in those cases, your original classifier will just not work at all anymore. So that that's an issue where your machine learning classifiers, because of these kind of because of these kind of artifacts in the data set, is learning a feature which doesn't really have to do with the attack itself. Like it's not it's not learning the specific behavior of a DOS golden attack. It's learning the behavior of the you know, the defensive setup of the victim web server. Um, all right, so now let's get into a second more, uh, yes, yeah, a second issue that was a bit more difficult to deal with, which is what we like to call the intent versus the effect of the attack. So imagine you have a web server somewhere, which is being attacked by a DOS slow loris. So another type of denial of service attack, which aims to bring the web server down. So the DOS loader is going to start a connection. Um, it's the first connection, so there's no problem for the web server to just accept the connection and answer. So then the DOS loader will start another thread asking, you know, the connection and another one, another one, and so on. And these DOS loader will, you know, try to keep the connection open for as long as possible. And then eventually, after enough of these requests, the web server is brought down. But however, the DOS Loloris is a persistent little bugger, and he continues asking, like, hey, I'd like to open a new connection. But the web server is already down, and so the web server is not able to respond. So you have more and more of these connection attempts coming in where the web server is not really able to respond anymore. So just for the record, every single one of these connection attempts will be separated into a different network flow because um because the port number that is uh, going to be used as a source port is different so the question is then these kind of network flows are they still dust slow lures because essentially it's trying to do a connection attempt which is just you know sending a single sin packet and it's not getting anything in return so if you look at that flow like just a single sin packet can you really say that that dust slow lures like can you say like this exhibits the behavior of dust loris? It's, it's just a, a connection attempt. So is it dust loris or is it benign? And that's actually yeah, not very clear. And depending on the setup that you're using, you might want to do either one of those. So what we did in order to um, shed some clarity, I guess, on this issue is to introduce the attempted label. So whenever you have, we have, you have this kind of supposedly malicious flow, we're going to do some manual inspection to see, you know, is it an actual attack flow or is there, you know, the intent of the attack, but nothing tangible in the network flow itself, which could, you know, 
which makes the attack malicious. So in the case of Doslo Loris, we would see, okay, does it actually have a malicious payload? And if it wouldn't have a malicious payload, then we would label it as that network flow as, you know, Doslo Loris attempted being that it has no malicious payload or it could have no payload at all. You know, we have all kinds of different attempted labels. Uh, one of them could also be, uh, let's say that you're trying to attack a victim, um, a victim web server or uh, any kind of victim server. And the port that you're trying to attack is actually closed. So whenever you're doing connection attempts, you're just getting, you know, reset packets in return, which means that you can't even execute your attack. Uh, so in that case, we would also say, you know, this is the attack which is attempted because the target port is closed. So in the end, that gives the researchers the choice, like for these kind of attempted labels, like do you want to relabel them as benign or do you want to keep them as malicious? And that can kind of depend on the setup that you're using. Um, now in our experiments and what is mostly used in network intrusion detection is that you're processing each flow separately. So that means that your your classifier is only going to see one flow at a time and it's not going to know anything about the context. So in these cases, it's better to take all of these attempted flows and just label them as benign, which is what we did in our experiments. Now, just to, to give a bit of an idea of how like how pervasive the issues are that we found, whenever we you know, we redid our labeling process. So we wanted to see like, okay, how many of these original labels were wrong? Like either, let's say for example, we have the DOS slow HTTP, uh, if you can see in the middle of the table. Um, when it, when we looked at all of the traffic for DOS slow HTTP, we found that 56% of those actually didn't contain a malicious payload at all because the target was you know, the, the victim web server was brought down. And so there were just like these connection attempts, which made, which constituted over 56, uh, over 50% of uh, all of the dust low HTTP traffic. So we relabeled them then as attempted. So similarly, if you look a bit uh, also around the middle of the table, oh wait, I have a mouse here. Okay. If you see here, you have uh, DDoS HOIC, which we found that over 86% of those, you yeah, have didn't actually contain a payload at all. We're just empty payloads, meaning that you know they're not even sending any HTTP requests to the to the web server they're trying to attack. So we relabeled them as attempted as well. Um, and then just to give another example, in the 2018, um, we have the infiltration attack, where we found that you know again 76% uh, of those were actually just was actually just purely benign traffic, and just yeah to give a bit more information what we found for this infiltration attack is that the authors well we don't know for exactly but we suspect that the authors whenever they were labeling infiltration traffic they just did like a broad time sweep for the for when the infiltration attack took place um and labeled all of that traffic as infiltration so we and we also know from from research that this infiltration attack was actually very very difficult to you know detect correctly in the 2018 data set and if you then see that well actually 76 percent of the infiltration traffic is benign it's no wonder that the that the uh, approaches used to detect infiltration failed um, quite miserably so what did we do then to improve the data set we first of all tried to yeah, improve the, the labeling ground truth. And we actually tried to get, like, let, let's say we, we went to the extent that we hopefully have for every single flow a correct label, which is probably impossible to do completely, but yeah, so that's, that's what we set out to do. Uh, we also added some functionality to the flow meter tool that the, um, has been used to create this data set, such as uh, adding features like the total TCP connection time, adding the ICMP protocol. We There were some issues in the flow, flow features that we corrected as well. We added quality of life um, changes like timestamps and microsecond precision, because in the previous uh, data sets, there were, the timestamps were either in minutes or in seconds, which is usually not granular enough if you're trying to uh, analyze traffic that, for example, from a DDoS attack, where all of the flows are very closely grouped together. And finally, then we made everything public on our website as well.
So yeah, just to have a bit of an idea of the impact of these um you know these labeling issues that we found we also conducted some experiments and so we found some interesting things so for example for let's uh, so the the black line is the loss when training for a new for the new fixed version of the data set and the um the gray line is the one that the uh, the loss for the published version of it is so we see that for example for the for the dos hulk attack um in the new data set, the model seems to be more successfully able to determine what exactly is a dos hulk attack. Whereas if you look, for example, at DOS low HTTP test, the model seems to struggle more. And if we look at the 2018 data set, um, we see some very similar things, like for DDoS HOIC, for example, the model seems to have a much better idea of, uh, or is much better at detecting a DDoS HOIC attack. Whereas for, for example, GoldenEye or uh, the web attack cross-site scripting, um, it becomes much more difficult. And we're not necessarily trying to argue that, um, you know, if you're, you know, if you use this fixed version of the data set, your model is going to perform better. Um, what we're arguing here is that once these labeling issues are fixed, um, the, let's say that you can evaluate the eff efficacy of your model much better. So the idea for is that you take a, approach for a network intrusion detection system and you train it on these data sets and then you look for and hopefully the idea would be that if your performance on this benchmark data set is you know is uh, is good as um, has uh, gets good performance metrics um you can de deploy your approach into the real world you know train it in the real world and expect to get similar results all right, so just um, to conclude um, what we did is, you know, so we performed a thorough critical reassessment of the quality of these two data sets, the feature extraction tool and the labeling logic. Uh, we found several issues across the whole data set pipeline and tried to improve, um, you know, whatever, whatever we could. And then everything um, that we, you know, our labeling logic, the, the corrected uh, feature extraction tool and so on is also available on a website. So in general, then, like if we zoom out a bit, like what kind of things do you need to keep in mind when you're doing when you're working with these kind of NIDS data sets? Well, the first one is that if you're getting good performance, that's not good enough. Like you need to know why is your performance good and what is it that your machine learning classifier is learning? We saw in you know some uh, one of the previous slides, if your machine learning classifier is learning to identify a five second delay in a certain attack because of a certain you know, countermeasure of a victim, that's not good enough. Um, that, that means that, you know, that's, that doesn't necessarily mean that your approach will generalize well to other network environments. So then also one thing that um, is a bit difficult to ask, but uh, we think is very necessary, is that whenever there are like new network intrusion detection data sets um, provided for the research com research community, they need to be vetted before we use like we need to have people who go in depth and look at you know are these are these correctly labeled like do we have a good variety of benign and malicious traffic like is it representative of the real world these kind of things and unfortunately right now it seems that the only way to do that is to do a deep dive into the data um, which is a tedious and manual process taking a long time but hopefully, I know that my colleague Lisa, maybe she can share some uh, things about that at some point, um, has you know started working on some things that could uh, could help with automated analysis for these kind of data set issues. So if we zoom out even a bit more, it's just uh, trying to think about what kind of things do we you know do we want in uh, when we're using any kind of security data set so that's not just maybe for network intrusion detection but it could also be for host intrusion detection or even for malware is that you want first of all a good variety of what, what makes benign and malicious traffic or you know benign and malicious behavior in general uh, you want that to be modern and representative of the real world like you want to be able to say like if my approach gets a good performance on this data set I can be relatively certain that if I deploy it into the wild, it's going to achieve a similar kind of performance. And then lastly, and most importantly, um, 
every kind of data set should have a thorough and complete documentation. Um, I'll come back to that in a previous uh, in, in the next slide, but uh, first I just want to give another quick um, pointer on like the, the, the variety of benign and malicious traffic, like some of the things that you might not necessarily think of. Um, so let's say this is what we see here on this slide is the setup that was used for the CISIS 2017 data set. So, I mean, the details are not very important, but it's just to know on the left here, you have the victim network and on the right here, you have the attacker network. So already all of the attackers are concentrated within one network. That means that if you're going to look at the attack traffic, there, are, there will very, very likely be some artifacts in the attack traffic that are related to the amount of time that it takes to travel between for packets between this attacker network and victim network. So ideally, you want not just one attacker network, but several, and then also, you know, in several at, at several places on on Earth, like just to see, like, okay, what if what is the difference between um, you know, an attack coming from Russia or an attack coming from China or you know these kind of things. Um, another thing you might also think about is that you know you see here, for example, you see uh, there's a Kali Linux uh, victim attack. No, sorry, a Kali Linux attacker. There are some Windows hosts, but then okay, what if you use a Mac to? Um, I I mean it's not. I guess it's not very likely, but you could technically also use a Mac to launch some of these attacks. And then you'll have some, you know, you'll have traffic which has some features that are very specific to a Mac operating system. Like, if, for example, the time to live values might be different, these kind of things. Uh, so if you're not including um, Mac hosts or like other, other kind of uh, hosts in here, and um, well, let's say if, it, it means that in the attack traffic that you're recording, you are likely to get a lot of artifacts that are related to these kind of operating systems. And so your, mm, your machine learning classifier might actually just learn to identify like, oh, this traffic came from a Kali Linux. Um, but you know, no matter what the traffic is, like we'll just label it malicious because we know that the Kali Linux only sends malicious traffic in this data set that we have. Uh, yeah, so these are the kind of things that you need to watch out for. And if you have a good variety in like the types of hosts that you use, the where your networks are located, the types of attacks that you use, the parameters that you use to run these attacks, like the more you have variety in that, the more you'll be sure that your machine learning approach is not overfitting to some kind of irrelevant details that have nothing to do with the attack itself. Then lastly, and one of the things that we think is the most important is that the data set should have a thorough and complete documentation. And literally like anything, well, almost anything could be done wrong in this data set, but as long as there's a thorough and complete documentation, people and researchers in the future can look at this documentation and, and identify the mistakes that were made and correct them. And yeah, because if you don't, if you don't have this documentation, it's really difficult to, to continue. And in, a fa in a fact, I think, a lot of the time that my colleague Lisa and I spent with this data set uh, was simply because the documentation was um, was lacking or the timestamps were not clear that we had to do, you know, manually try to re-engineer what was the labeling logic that they used and, you know, in what sense uh, were there issues with it. Uh, so, yeah, and then like the kind of things that you want documentation on is like obviously the labeling logic you want to have source code for the attack tools that are used the attack scenario setup like when you executed the attack how many hosts are part of the attack uh and so on and then ideally also things like host configuration and network setup and i mean there, there there's a pretty long list like there there are a lot of things here that you can include in the documentation but yeah once 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 all of those would be there i think it would make the task a lot easier and this is not just for network intrusion detection there are a lot of uh, i'm sure that for uh, host intrusion detection and probably for malware as well, there is a, a lot of value in having this documentation. So with that, I'd yeah, like to round up my presentation and thank you all for your attention. And I'll be happy to take any questions or have a discussion about the, you know, the, 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 the state of um, network intrusion detection in general in research or, you know, what are what the colleagues from the other security um, security fields see as uh, as issues in their field.